Hi, I'm Jake. Welcome to Deck Building for Idiots. As you can see, I build a lot of decks. And also, I'm an idiot. Today I want to cover everything from the basic structure of the deck and how many lands and non-land cards to the specific card choices and how we build up a particular strategy. I believe this applies to everything from casual 60 card magic all the way up to full on CEDH. So pull up a chair, have a seat at the table, and whether you're a button mash, hack and slash controller bash, or a meeple moving mastermind of maps, mats, and minis, if you ruffle at the awful ruffle shuffle scuffle, or if you're a click clack, pick attack, number ball luck sack, we're all here for the same reason. I'm Jake, let's talk games. So I've said this before, but the key balancing factor in all of Magic the Gathering is mana value, both in color and quantity. So when we start talking about a deck and we start looking at different strategies, the first place that we need to start building is our mana base. And I know that seems backwards, but I want to talk about the proportion of lands that you should include in your deck for any given strategy. And I think a good starting point in both 60 card magic and 100 card magic is that 40% line. As a general rule of thumb, every deck should have between 30 and 40% lands. This means in a commander deck, you're going to be starting at 40 lands in your deck, and in a 60 card deck, you're going to be starting with 24. Now that number can move around depending on what your deck is trying to do. A good metric for commander is to reduce the number of lands by half the number of non-land mana accelerators you have in your deck. Now this can either be artifacts or creatures that tap for mana, or spells that search for additional lands. And as you add those cards to your deck, you can reduce the lands in your deck by about half that amount. So by including 10 mana accelerators in a given commander deck, you can reduce your land count by 5. Running 35 lands and 10 mana acceleration cards is a pretty good starting point for most decks. In some cases, you'll run far more than that, and in certain decks that really care about lands, you might run 40 lands anyways. That gives you the flexibility to run many non-basic lands that don't tap for the mana that you need and are just there for specific utility purposes. In a 60 card deck, our rule is a little bit different. I think you run that based on the strategy and the curve that you are trying to hit. Starting at 24 lands for an average deck is pretty solid, but reducing that to 18 to 20 if you're running a very low mana cost aggro deck that only ever needs to get to 3 land can be a good strategy and keep those cards that actually provide value in your hand for when you need them rather than sitting in play as a basic land that you don't need. And I think this is the point at which we pause on discussing lands until we sort out what strategy and what specific type of deck we want to build. And then we'll go back and look at how we produce different colors with the land base that we've structured out. So let's move on to talking about those non-land cards and how we build out the rest of our deck. Moving on from our discussion about lands, I think it's time to move on to the rest of the deck and talk about the non-land cards that we want to add. This is where we get into the real heart and soul of deck building. When you design a deck, I believe there's two main ways to do it, either top-down or bottoms-up. Now in top-down deck construction, we are looking for one specific aspect of the game. This could be a combo win condition, it could be our commander, it could be a particular interaction that we want to really center the deck around, and you build everything else to support that. This is a very good strategy if you are buying cards specifically for that deck. Bottoms up is the reverse. This is the style of deck construction that you use when you were drafting a deck, or when you were playing a sealed tournament, or if you have a large collection of cards and are not interested in buying new ones. You're working from a fixed pool to build the best deck that you can. So you're looking for interactions that you might stumble across, or if you're more organized than me, can sort digitally in a variety of different online tools. Let's break these apart one at a time and start with top-down deck construction. Top-down deck construction is probably the most popular way of building a deck for Commander. 
a lot of people will pick their commander and then look at the ways that other people have used that strategy. A good source for this type of information is EDHREC, right? It's a website that lists the most popular commanders and then within each of those commanders, the most popular cards that are commonly played. This gives you a really good feel for which cards should be added to the deck. And you can even use the average deck build feature of the website to put together a full commander deck for you from that aggregate data. EDHREC has a couple of issues if you are trying to build a specific type of deck for a commander that's a little more flexible. I had this experience recently when I was trying to build this deck, the Necrobloom. See, the Necrobloom has a really neat little ability that gives every land in your graveyard dredge two. Now, if you get flashbacks when you hear land with dredge two, you've probably played against the Gitrog monster before. And it turns out that if you're running the Necrobloom as your commander, all you need is the Gitrog monster and a discard outlet, and your deck goes infinite. You draw the entire deck, and then you can cast pretty much whatever you want, as long as you have a way to shuffle your graveyard back into your library. This is the core strategy of the Gitrog Monster CEDH deck. So when you are building the Necro Bloom, you'll note on EDH Rec the number one recommended card is the Gitrog Monster. And it works really well to build the deck like that, but if you're not trying to build the deck like that, there's a bit of a gap. And there's not a lot of other strategies that really cohesively rise to the top. And so some of those resources, even for building a top-down deck, leave a little bit to be desired. Fortunately, there's other websites like Scryfall and others that allow you to search for specific cards by different attributes. And you can sort them a variety of different ways. You can even filter by dollar value if you're looking to stay under a certain budget. But top-down deck construction is really useful for building a deck from scratch. But what if we're not? What if we have a fairly sizable collection? A lot of cards that live in boxes, and we want to find a home for them. We want to find a viable deck that we can build from the cards we already have on hand. When we are doing bottoms-up deck construction, I like to keep all of the cards that I cut from my other decks. And as I make those cuts, I put them into a box that looks like this. This is a collection of half-built decks, half-formed ideas, interesting interactions that just, for one reason or another, didn't end up making the cut. And then you can go back at a later date, as you were building another deck, and grab a selection of cards from the box, for either inspiration or as a gap filler to finish off a deck that you have in progress. This particular block are the cards that I cut from my Jota the Unifier deck. I was putting together a Jota deck and I wanted to build the entire thing using showcase frame legendary cards. So this has a variety of secret layers and a variety of other showcase cards to fill out the deck. All of these cards are strong, all of these cards are useful in certain cases, but for one reason or another, they just didn't quite make it into Jota. But this stack of cards gets put in a box, gets set aside, and over time, will find its way into other decks. And this doesn't just apply to Commander. I do this for 60 card decks as well. I have a mostly built Legacy Aluren deck that I am slowly revising to be a pre-modern Aluren deck. And I think it can be really strong, and I'm excited about playing it when it's done. But for now, as I accrue the pieces, it lives in a box like this, and it makes it much easier to find those pieces when I finally go to build the deck. So now that we've talked a little bit about building a particular strategy and organizing our cards in a way that suits us well for top-down or bottoms-up, I think it's time to move on to actually making the deck function. How do we balance colors? How do we balance interaction in the deck? So at this point, we have a pretty good feel for how many lands we're running in our deck and the types of non-land cards that we're running in our deck and maybe even how many non-land cards. But making those cuts and building a cohesive strategy that provides us the right colors at the right time 
can be really tricky. My approach is to ignore land for now and take all of our non-land cards and arrange them by mana cost. Start at zero mana and make a pile for each converted mana cost up to whenever you run out of piles. If anything is at seven mana or higher, you can probably group all of that together. But then I think we should take a second pass at it. Look at the cards included in each pile that don't need to be cast on that turn. Just because you have a Swords to Plowshares in the one mana slot doesn't mean you're going to cast it turn one. And just because you have a large creature in the seven mana slot doesn't mean you're planning on casting it turn seven. If something's going to be discarded as reanimation fodder, it doesn't need to be in your curve. If something is going to be held in your hand as a response, it doesn't need to be included in your curve. Once you've removed those cards, you get a pretty realistic look at how those cards are going to progress over time. If you're running really heavy mana acceleration, I would actually encourage you to shift things around based on when that mana acceleration is going to hit. This means if you're expecting to have four mana on turn three every single game, you can probably move those cards down and look at your curve with the four mana cost cards in the three mana cost slot. And this gives you the picture of that tempo of your deck. With that curve established, I think we need to also look at the staying power of our cards. And what I mean by that is how likely those cards are to be removed immediately. A two or three mana cost enchantment is going to live a lot longer than a two or three mana cost creature, especially if that creature is good. So when you build out your mana curve, think about when removal is going to hit, when your cards are going to come down, and what recovery or interactive options you have in that pile that you set aside. Are you running enough removal? Are you running enough counter spells? Do you have enough reanimation targets to suit the reanimation spells you have in the rest of your deck? Now that we have our curve established, we can start looking at colors. We can take each pile on each turn and see how color hungry it is. It's possible that we need to run as many City of Brass effects as we possibly can. However, it's possible that we don't care about our colored mana as much, and we can run a higher density of colorless utility lands in our deck. Now that we've been thinking about how our curve fits and how our lands can be structured, we can start making cuts, picking which cards aren't quite good enough. And maybe some of those high mana cost cards are just there to help you win the game when you're already winning. And those can be removed because we're winning the game anyways. And some of those low mana cost cards, no matter how good they are, aren't going to stick around long enough to impact the game. And now we move on to the most important aspect of deck building. And that is testing it out, seeing how well the deck functions. We've gone through the steps of figuring out how many lands we need, what our non-land cards look like, what strategies we're employing, what colors we need to hit at what point, what type of interaction we're going to be able to hold in our hand, which cards we expect to stay throughout the rest of the game, and which cards are absolutely critical to protect and keep in play. But now it's time to test it. And when you test out your deck, I'd encourage you to find people with the same attitude towards the game for the deck that you built. If you want to make something completely weird and goofy and just for fun, find some opponents that have weird, goofy, just for fun decks and try it out there. If you're building a deck that's intended to be extremely competitive and fit into a specific metagame, test it against that metagame. Find good ways to try the deck out in a lot of different situations. But you can restrict those situations to when that deck will actually be used. And I think at that point, you can start making more intelligent cuts and adds to the deck based on that. You can start seeing metagames develop and create new environments to play those decks. One of the things that I really like to do is taking all of my old draft chaff and cuts from old EDH decks and piling them up and making really bad EDH decks. I think it's fun to play Commander at power 7, 8, 9, but it can also be really fun to play Commander at power level 1 and 2. 
I think it's important to set that baseline of what a bad deck actually looks like and encourage your friends to do the same. That impotent slap fight that you end up with power level one decks can be just as entertaining and just as rules complex as it turns out as some of the really competitive decks. So I'd encourage you to try it out, build some new decks, try out some new strategies. If you are dead set on building top down and picking a commander and building the entire deck around it, try going the other direction. Try pulling out a box of stuff that you're not using anymore and build the best possible deck you can from that. And if you're used to start, starting with a fixed pool and building your deck only from what you have on hand, maybe try the other way around. Pick a specific strategy or a specific commander and build a deck entirely around that. Proxy it out and try playing a deck that is built bespoke for one purpose because it's a very different gameplay experience. And I think that does make us better deck builders and it helps us see both sides of the equation and we become better magic players for it. It's been really nice talking to you.